and classes in session here on the Professor's Podcast. I'm Paul Fabrizio. And I'm Don Frazier. Welcome to McMurray University's Professor's Podcast. We're here to talk all sorts of stuff, aren't we, Don? Well, a university is a strange sort of place, full of smart people and all sorts of folks that pass by us day to day, all with an interesting story to tell. So we figured, well, it's probably time to start capturing some of these stories. That's right. So I teach political science at McMurray. I've been here for 20-something years, 21 years, something like that. Yeah, and you. Man. I'm an old man. Okay, and how long have you been here, Don? I've been peddling history here for 25 years, quarter of a century. That is an interesting way to put it, peddling history. Yeah. What does that mean? I read Uh, dead people's mail, you know that. Yeah, I know you do, but (laughs) peddling? That sounds like you're trying to sell something. Well, aren't you selling a product? No, I'm just here to educate. That's yeah. all I'm here to do. <laughs> you better sell them on it or they ain't buying it. Uh, anyway, we want to introduce our fancy engineer. He's the guy in the white headphones over here. Yeah, he's got the magic headphones. <laughs> That's right. Why are your headphones white? And we haven't even said your name yet. Scott the engineer. So Scott. why are your headphones white? Dare to be different. <laughs> and that's what was on sale in San Diego because I saw him buy them. Okay, very good. I didn't want to look like him sitting next to him in the plane. You know, we got both got black headphones. Twinkies. On. Yeah. <laughs> so, no. So you're going to be here, and your job is to make sure we do everything on time and in the right way. And you have a seven second delay to beep us if we happen to say something inappropriate. Sure. Sure. But you said we had rules for things like that. Didn't we we want to make sure we want we want this to be audience friendly. And, and if the Pope or the President said it, you can say it. Man, with this President. Uh, whoa, we. <laughs> <Katie Barthador. laughs> so, you know, we're doing this, what day is today? February 2nd, Correct. 2018. And our President is Donald Trump. So. Yes, and the Groundhog said six more weeks of winter. That's right. So that's well, why we're inside. That. Yeah, that's why we're dressed warmly here. So, the point of this podcast is to share information, to invite comment, and to have guests. And we just want to entertain and educate at the same time. Does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, we're in a, a community of scholars. and Wow, as that's, a result, that's special. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound so strong. But there's just so many cool and you know, almost magical things that happen at a university. And I wonder what university he's been at. Magical so things. Ooh. Cynical. <laughs> I mean, just think about the lives you transform in your class. That's true. And the interesting lives that come across, uh, you know, through our doors every day. So, anyhow, this it it offers a unique vantage. Yes. For kind of viewing the human condition as Americans pursue it. There you go. Now. I have been doing a radio show here in the city of Abilene for years and years and years called The Professors. About a decade and a half, haven't you? Something like that. We yeah. started, oh, a long time ago, 2003. Yeah, I was about to say. A long time. And Don Frazier has been a frequent guest. I have. And the response when Don talks is really strong on the part of the audience. He has something to say. So what we thought is we'd combine our talents. Yeah. And maybe out of that we'd produce something that would be really fun to listen to. Well, and something that would actually occupy a part of the sort of bandwidth out there with all the information uh, that's available. You know, when you do radio, once you've done it, it's gone. It vaporizes. And this is a low power station, (laughs) kind of a small market. And we said, you know what would be better than this? If we took our show on the road. So that's what's led us into this podcast. So we went from a radio studio to this studio. Yeah. That's as, as roadie as we're going to get on the show. And we're ready to go and have a good time. We've got some guests lined up. We have really interesting topics that we want to talk about. This is an interesting world that we live in. And what we want to do is provide a West Texas perspective. Small liberal arts college. Small liberal arts. arts. <laughs> I can small, say this. Small liberal arts kibble. So yes. that too. So that is our perspective here, and we're going to be getting going as soon as we come back from our first break, which is in 15 seconds, according to the clock on the wall. And I do that just so we can point out the job of Scott the engineer. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was profundity. Yes, right it there. was. So we'll be back in just a moment.
And we're back. <laughs> yeah. We're new at this thing. We're trying to figure out who do we look at and yeah, all that stuff. so many so, fingers flying yes, around. Yes, indeed. I'm not sure what pointing like this means, but it must be something pretty important. Scott? That means go. That means go. Okay, so we're supposed to go. We're going. We're going. Okay. So Paul Fabrizio, Don Frazier, Scott the Engineer here on the Professor's Podcast. And as I'm sure you might have noticed if you're watching on the video, we have a guest sitting to my right. We do? We do. And this guest looks like he's related to co-host Don Frazier. Don, why don't you introduce our I will, guest? I will introduce my older brother, Tim Frazier. And I wanted to bring Tim in on this inaugural journey uh, because he has an interesting educational story to tell. He teaches at a school that has fewer than 200 students K through 12. Mm -hmm. So he's had graduation, graduating classes of nine or 10. Our, our smallest was three. Three, graduating class of three. You know, and you forget that there's places like this in America. So, <laughs> yes, you do. Thanks for the, coming to the show. I know you were in town and I just snagged you into it, but hey, congrats. Yeah, we're glad you're here. Yeah. So, can you tell us where this school is? Uh, it's in Richards, Texas, where Highway 149 and 1486 intersect. That literally is it. That's the town. Okay, the bad that, part of town is from that curb to that yeah. curb. Yeah. Our, <laughs> our little town is six blocks by four blocks, 24 blocks total. Wow. And it's rural community. I mean. Okay, but what part of Texas is this? It's in, in uh, 30 miles west of Huntsville in East Texas. Oh, way yeah. down there. Yeah. Not far from Houston. We're 30 miles from Huntsville, 30 miles from Bryan College Station, 30 miles from Navasota. It's like 30 miles is our spot. So where the pine trees give way to the oak trees. Yep. Now, why does a town like this exist? Uh, it exists because Robin Hood money where okay. the state takes so much oil and gas money from uh, school districts to redistrib re handle to give out to other uh, smaller, poor school districts. However, we are a smaller, poor school district, but we make more money than we have students. And by state standards, you get paid by your students. So we have an extra... So you're a contributing school district. We are. But and let's, you know, in all honesty, it's also a safety value because Uncle Sugar's not going to give up on a two hundred thousand dollar year payday. Yeah, correct. So they keep us in business. As long as we have students, they'll keep us in business. So in wow. the classification of which schools are defined here in the state of Texas, I assume you're a one A school? One A sitting on a Houston phone book. Because I mean, <laughs> we, you have to work hard to tip the scale into one A. Wow! Wow! Yeah. So, do you have any athletic teams or drama yes. or Why, band yes, or anything? We do. Why? We have, yes, uh, we do. <laughs> we have a girls volleyball team. A couple of years ago, they went to the semifinals in the state playoffs. Oh wow! Which was pretty cool. And then we have basketball team. Sometimes we have eight kids. Sometimes we have five kids. So. Bad case of the flu could forfeit a game. Wow. So you don't play with four people? Uh, no. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> Just didn't and fare. We, matter of fact, we went to a girls' basketball game, and the girls fouled out so much that at the end of the game, we were fielding two girls on the court. It was two against five for the last minute of the game because we didn't want to forfeit. We lost wow. anyway, but, you know, at, at, a school you lost that, with honor. at a school that small, you have to think about it, you could be a star. Yeah. I mean, we just started baseball for the first time in 12 years. Wait, wait. How do you play baseball with that few kids? Well, we actually scraped together seven boys and three girls and fielded a team. And I really miss my right fielder from last year because she could throw a frozen rope from right field to home play. Whoa. Yeah. She also did the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life in baseball. She couldn't hit a grapefruit. I mean, she was an awful batter. But she could crowd the plate, and she got over the plate and just got drilled in the side. I mean, that big, fat smack, you know, awful. And she looked at the pitcher. She put her bat down and looked at the pitcher went, and took her base. <laughs> there you go. And then proceeded to steal second and score on a deep ball to center field. Wow. So we will take anyone, anywhere, anytime to play baseball. 
That, that's fantastic. So but, is there a co, co-ed league? No. So you're you can, playing all boys teams. Yes, and they have to get out there and they have to take a fastball. They got to be able to hit anything that's thrown at them. They got to be able to catch anything that's thrown at them. Wow. So uh, this year we're hoping to field our first uh, female catcher because none of the boys will do it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> because uh, they, they just, just don't want to play. They're catching. better at other things. And, you know, I have two pitchers, and so I don't want to tie them up in a catcher's position. So what I really need is a catcher who doesn't pitch. Now. Tell us about your background coaching baseball. Uh, I took the history of baseball at Texas Tech when I was a student there, and I fell in love with the game. You know, the history of baseball was not all about who hit what in 1937 and when did they do away with the spitter, which was 1947, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Good to know. I yeah. fell in love Studied with the game. Studied for the final anyway, yeah. Right. And the reason I fell in love with the game is because baseball is America. Throughout the, the tapestry, the fabric that is America, the one common thread we all have is baseball. And so I fell in love with the game. So when they came out and said, we want to field a baseball team, and one other guy said, I'll coach it, and I kind of looked around and was like, I don't know. And little bit by little, I got sucked in, you know, like well, the well, mafia. You know, well, you well, try to get out, they suck you right back how in. Many, how many teachers are there at this school? Uh, in the what? high school, there are six Actually, so you junior really, high and high school because I teach junior high as well. So you really didn't have much choice, no, there did wasn't you? a broad spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> we have a new ag teacher we're trying to uh, rope into this. He's a lot younger. <laughs> and the budget for our baseball team is me. <laughs> it all comes out of my wallet. And believe me, when my wife read my Amazon account last year, she was wondering why you were buying all those mitts. Yeah. I, had, I had to respond in kind, and it really, really cost a lot of money. Honey, why do we have a catcher's kit? Right. <laughs> what are yeah. you doing with that cup there? <laughs> well, when you buy a, a pitcher's trainer that has a radar gun and can tell you by the way the ball's hitting the target, if it's a strike or a ball, those aren't cheap. And you kind of slip that under the Amazon radar, but uh, they always find out. Yeah. Now, now, now i got to ask, I'm sure you do other things besides teaching and coaching baseball. Are you like the drama teacher or the band teacher or I something like that too? I am a junior senior class representative, and I, code, I do that with another teacher. And so we have to do a Halloween carnival every year. And the politically correct thing is the fall festival. It's a Halloween carnival. <laughs> but think about it. In a town that's 24 blocks big and it's lower income, where do you go trick-or-treat? Do you drive your kids to Huntsville and go to neighborhoods you don't know? Isn't there a jail there you can also go to? <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't even have a jail. If you get in trouble, you got to go to Huntsville and get locked up. Yeah, so, well, and why would you trick-or-treat <laughs> the, prison. the prison? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> to be honest with you, for emergency services, uh, we're 30 minutes away from any emergency service. So ambulance, fire. So one day we were having baseball practice, and a principal called me before practice and said, no practice today. I said, what the heck? It's beautiful out there, and we finally got good. And so I said, uh, we got to land a helicopter in the baseball field because somebody had a heart attack in the village. And so they had to bring this lady out to the baseball field and load her up on a helicopter and okay. fly her out. So we didn't get to have practice that day. So these are not problems that bigger cities have to deal no, with. No, I mean bigger cities have their issues. You right. know, gunfights in the school and yeah. know, teen pregnancy, drugs, blah blah blah. But let's face it: in my world, if a kid skips school, I just open the window and see him playing in his yard and yell at him, "Get your butt in school!" It's like being in the 1920s. It is. It, well, I always look out for Comanches to ride through. And <laughs> yeah, we're missing a couple of third graders. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but it is the best job I'd ever had in my life. But you didn't Barnum. start out this way. Nope. I was in the private sector for 20 years in manufacturing, and I've made anything from plastic pellets to the brake systems that go on offshore oil rigs. And I laid out the schedules for all of that. Started in paper and ended up in petroleum. And just one day, that was enough. I can't make the world safe for plastic anymore. No. <laughs> and so Don talked me into going up to uh, Region 6 and getting my certificate. And I got to thinking about it. I do history for free. 
Mm -hmm. I go to museums for free, and here are some suckers, I mean people, <laughs> who pay me to go and do that, teach history. Okay. So. so, real quickly, before we take our next break, which classes do you teach? I teach everything social studies, 7 through 12. So, Texas history, U.S. first half, U.S. second half, government, economics, world history, uh, business, coding, and I have to proctor Spanish classes. And baseball. And baseball. And coach baseball. And yeah. junior, senior faculty rep or yeah. student rep or something. And he's got to chaperone them when they go on their cruise, yeah. too. Every, every, other year, year. every other year we take the kids on a cruise. <laughs> they raise the money. They have to raise the money to go on the cruise. Now, I have grown accustomed to a certain lifestyle, so I add my money to make sure my accommodations are a little better. But... It's good to be All the king. kids get to go. Yeah, yeah. It pays to have low friends in high places. Okay, we're going to take a break right now. We'll be back. And we're back, and this is Paul Fabrizio. I'm Don Frazier. Our the, guest is Tim Frazier. That's right. We're here of the professors here on this podcast. And I find myself in the strange position of sitting between two Frasers who both like history. And I want to know why. What is it about the Frasers that can, they like history? So I can tell you let's the go exact to you first, Tim. I okay. got the Thunderbolt. The Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt. Five years old. I was out on the family ranch, and I picked up an arrowhead. And I held this arrowhead in my hand, 12,000 years old or better. In my hand, in my hand, is something somebody touched 12,000 years ago. So in essence, I'm shaking hands with someone from 12,000 years. And so there's the thunderbolt. Okay, now you're going to have to say, where was this? In Big Spring, Texas. In Big Spring, Texas. Mm -hmm. So what Indian tribe what native tribe would that be oh i know that okay we turn to don frazier got no idea what do you mean you got no right, idea because it's twelve thousand years ago i mean yeah. so all you can talk about then is culture groups when i talk to the kids about that i just say look i'm holding something that larry the indian carved yeah. out yeah it was larry the indian yeah 
<laughs> because if you tried away. to give Boom. them a name, a high school kid's eyes are going to roll back in their head. Well, and really, you can't give them a name because there's nobody sitting around writing down their names. That's, so, so we don't know which tribe. So you can't say that's a Comanche or no, because the Comanches a, aren't invented until 1705. Oh, you think about it. All the Indians that we know and love are wearing the name somebody else put on them, with very few exceptions. So the Comanches called themselves the Numina. The Numina. Numina. Yeah, so like, mm, okay. banana pudding, <laughs> Numina, Numina. <laughs> yeah, but Numina. And they're, uh, that just means the people, the human beings, which means okay. that you and you mm-hmm. and you We're are all... not Numina. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> We're not the human beings. But that, okay. that tells you something about how Comanches saw themselves. But the word Comanche is actually a Ute word for the people who always want to fight us all the time. So it's not even their own name for themselves. So, for instance, the Pueblo Indians were named Mm -hmm. Pueblo Indians by the Spanish because they lived in Pueblos. Pueblos. (laughs) Yeah, they lived in villages. And so uh, when you're talking about something that predates the written record, you can't say, well, this is a Comanche point or not. This is made by a certain culture group that has a certain way of making a point that looks exactly like the people down the creek are making their points. So we'll call this, you know, the Bird Creek culture. And, and that's as close as you can get. So is that the real name then no, for the culture? No, I just made that up. You just made that up. Yeah. Okay. That's how history is done? That's no, right. not at all. <laughs> well, I haven't seen the point, so I can't, you know, Okay, so an anyway, opinion. when you were five years old, you found uh-huh. this arrowhead, and you go, I am touching... Yeah, since history. then I've been fascinated with people in history and how they view things. There are, there are historians who love the, the grand spectrum. Yeah. They want to read the strategic stuff of World War II. I want to know about the lunch bucket guy. The lunch bucket the, guy. What, what, what do you mean by that? In, Joe Panzer Shrek. Yeah, <laughs> I want to know about the guy that was there chewing the dirt and getting dirty. I want to know about the lady who was building B-24s. Okay, but history isn't written about those people, is it? It all is. It's oh, all man. about all of us. It's Look, yesterday yesterday guy. is your history. Somewhere yeah, in Yeah, but your, I'm not going to tell anybody about somewhere, that. Somewhere, yeah. Well, Nobody's going to write a book about dude, yesterday for me. There's photographs. But they made there's yeah, no podcast, <laughs> I'm just saying. But, I mean, somewhere, someone in your family is going to ask you about this. Okay. And that's history. And we're nothing special. I mean, Joe Lunchbuck. I'm right a here. broken down, aging country school teacher who coaches baseball. Who coaches baseball and goes in, on cruises in, with the kids in Richardson, Texas. In Richards, Texas. Richards. I'm sorry. Yeah. Apologize. Uh, we actually the town's named after a, a T and P accountant, Texas and Pacific Railroad accountant. A lunch bucket kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. How cool. Well, let's turn to Don. Don, when did you become interested in history? I think uh, plastic army men were my gateway drug. Okay. You know, just playing with them and, and thinking to myself, what's this all about? You know, how come these blue guys are here and gray guys are here? So did you play with Civil War guys? Yeah, or? I played with all of them. Okay, because uh, I played with uh, Vietnam War guys and World War II guys. Yeah, Vietnam is kind of his... his uh, That's my bailiwick. Though. That's your bailiwick. Yeah, and, you know, I just fell into the Civil War playing with my even older brothers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Civil War said, I mean, I'm youngest of ten. I'm number ten. He's number eight. There's 10 in your family. Yes, there is. I mean, between the three of us, we've nearly populated this country. I'm just saying. <laughs> but, uh, so you didn't have a, a lightning moment like your brother here well, did? Well, uh, I sort of did. So okay. I'm, I'm playing with Army men and thinking, man, this is actually pretty cool. But mine came about sixth grade. And we were living in Macon, Georgia. And uh, I went to work one day with my dad on the weekend. He was like, you're kind of underfoot. Mm-hmm. And you kind of go do something and entertain yourself. And there was a nearby cemetery. And so he said, why don't you go look at that cemetery? I'm sure there's something interesting in there. And um, I discovered a number of uh, dead Confederates there. Okay. And I'd never run into a dead Confederate before. You know, I'd only seen little plastic army men. And being from Texas, I didn't know that there was anything special about the Civil War. Mm-hmm. But these dead Confederates were Texans. Uh, and I okay. said, wait a second, I'm a Texan living in Georgia, looking at dead Texans that are buried in Georgia. What's the story on this? So, you know, I asked my dad, and dad said, well, let me introduce you to the concept of research. And wrote mm-hmm. off for the military records and 
Oh, he wrote off for the military he, records. No, no, my dad didn't ever do anything like that. He said, "You, you write, write off, off for the, the records. Mil- Here's how you do it." And so he introduced me to the concept of research. And so while reading cool, people's mail, and yeah, stuff. reading dead people's mail. So my cool people like Scott are playing baseball. <laughs> I'm reading the encyclopedia in the living room of my house, watching everybody else out there playing ball. And I'm afraid I'm going to get asthma, you know. So <laughs> I'm in there reading about all the Civil War stuff, and that just reading dusty military records. Yeah, and it, it just went from being kind of something I did for fun into something I do as a profession, a job. Now yeah. you have to understand the environment we were raised in. And okay. My dad made us learn something new every day. Yeah, pretty much. Oh. And when we sat out and had dinner at night, we had to tell dad what we learned. Now it could be. If you give Kenneth Bewley a quarter, he'll eat a cricket in the yeah. cafeteria. <laughs> That's knowledge. That's knowledge. <laughs> or, you know, I learned how to do some complex algebra equations. Whoa. Okay. And you had to, you had that to learn something. Ever. Yeah, never me. <laughs> but it and, sounds good. At- but it paid off in the private sector because my first job at Kimberly Clark was learning stock code numbers for the boxes you put Kleenex in. I was in charge of making sure we didn't run out of those. That and was so your main I, objective. That, <laughs> was, that was it. And I had to learn these seven-digit numbers. I guess one. it's and good so somebody it, does that kind yeah, of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exciting <laughs> stuff, let me tell you. Yeah, but you never want to run out of tissue. I'm yeah, sorry, I mean, well, Kleenex is a trademark But brand. let's put this into perspective. <laughs> you may want to put that in our notes. Because I learned something every day. I learned these stock code numbers. I did not run us out of containers, which made us shut down the production line, which sends people home without money. Whoa. And you're okay. getting in their wallet and you're taking food out of their kids' mouths. So you had a pretty vital job. Uh, That's my, what you yeah. thought, yeah. In manufacturing, the, in, yeah. when you plan, you can shut down factories if you want to. You don't stay long, but you can do that. <laughs> you can do. So the pressure of this drove you into teaching this, the, teaching then, right? To get yeah. away from that kind of pressure. Uh, well, I no. can shut down factories. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> teaching is a lot more fun and relaxing. Okay. What's your favorite historical period? Hang on. Before you roll that in. We have to take a break. Yeah, I was about to say. Ah, yeah. uh, there, there's that clock again. Hold that thought. And now a word about pizza. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in, I don't know how long, but we're going to take a break in two seconds. So, we'll be back.
And we're back, and this is Paul Fabrizio and Don Frazier. And we're talking about history and how people got into history because we have the two Frazier brothers here. And before the break, we asked you what your favorite era was in uh, history. Vietnam War. Why? Because, one, I grew up watching it on TV. Yeah. Used to fight my brothers for the Life magazine because Life magazine always covered mm -hmm. all of the Vietnam War. Then when I went into manufacturing, I worked with tons of vets. I got so good that I could read their tattoos and tell where they got them, what Liberty town they got them on. Like in Subic Bay or in Bangkok, Thailand or in Hong Kong or in Tokyo or Hawaii. I could read tattoos and it just sprung off from that. I did my senior thesis in college on comparison contrast of the Plains Indian Wars and the Vietnam War with the strategic hamlet uh, system and the reservation system. And so that's just been did, my deal. Did you come along, would you have been eligible for the draft? Oh, no, I was in you, short britches then. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I was, short britches. Yeah, I was born in 1961. So. so you missed it by several years? By several years. Okay. But it's always been an era that's fascinated me and it just carries on. I mean, I spent two weeks in high school teaching the Vietnam War, which wow. they don't do yeah. at other You're schools. Right. Yeah. They, they run right, right past Well, it. they have to start at the beginning, and it, history uh -huh. keeps going on and on, so there's less time to cover well, important things. Well, I skip over things. the boring bits and go right to the Vietnam War. Right, and right now it's the 50th anniversary of mm -hmm. the Tet Offensive. Absolutely. Right. So. Absolutely. Well, let's turn to Don. Don, yes. your favorite part of history, your favorite era. Well, the one that I've written the most about is the American Civil War. Okay. And, you know, the way I came into it is by, you know, meeting all those dead reps. Uh, I was convinced that there would never be a future in teaching history. And I had a lot of older brothers mm -hmm. <laughs> that convinced me that if I was – Going into the history business, I was wasting my life, and I would hate to be a school teacher and stuff like that. So I went into the communication business. Okay. And so I was a newspaper guy, and I was a gunfighter at Six Flags, and uh, actually a uh, gunfighter oh, at yeah, Six that Flags. Was yeah. A, may have been the best job I ever had. Got to die eight times a day for a living. Um, and people applauded when you died oh, too, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, he's dead. That's probably coming up in my future too. So anyhow, um, I finally took a job with the defense industry because I figured that would be a grown-up job with benefits and I was getting married and stuff and man that was the worst job I have ever had in my life it was horrible two years of extreme tedium really oh it was, mm, grim so not even as good as the manufacturing no because he was actually contributing I was just moving paper around because you know defense industry contracts are built around cost plus so the more this particular company could make a vehicle cost, the more their profit was. So I really didn't have a job. Uh, as one person put it, I was on white collar welfare. <laughs> so I, had, you know, I was taking taxpayer dollars, and the problem was I was smart enough to realize what was happening. And it didn't make you feel good. It did, did it? not make me feel good. And, and one time I figured they had an incentive for you know cost savings if you can figure out how to. You know, save us some money, we'll give you a, a bonus check. So I figured out how to save this company about $600,000 a month. And by golly, they gave me a $50 bonus check, Whoa. 38 after withholding. And so <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, why am I wasting my life here? You know, There's got to be something you got to spend your life doing something, and this shouldn't be it. And so um, I was driving down uh, I-30 mm -hmm. in Fort Worth, Texas, and I saw an exit that said University Drive. And I said to myself, I suspect there may be a university at the end of that drive. You know, that's how sophisticated my approach was to graduate school. My undergraduate degrees in communication. Now I said, well, I'm, I want to go study history now. So I uh, went down University Drive, found a uh, university at the end of that drive. They, they had horn frogs down there. They too. did. They had yes. horn frogs of plenty. Yes. Uh, and so once I saw the purple and white horizon, uh, I went to graduate school there, and it has launched me into a, a really great life. I mean, it was a great decision that day, that rainy day, after I left the uh, bomber factory. 
the Bomber Factory uh, to go to the university. To go to the university. That's exactly right. And we need to say, you have written several books on the Civil War. Correct. You want to tell us briefly what they are? Well, you know, it, they're all about Texas and Louisiana and the Civil War. Mm-hmm. So my first book is Blood and Treasure. And Blood and Treasure has to do with the Confederate invasion of New Mexico. Wait, I thought you said there were Texas and Louisiana. But well, you started in New Mexico. Well, because the Texans way left, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, left Texas to invade New Mexico. Such a political scientist. Anyhow, <laughs> and so that was sort of the, the, the catalytic book. Um, that was my dissertation that was turned into a book. And then the troops that fought in... New Mexico, the Confederate troops, the Texas troops, ended up reinforcing uh, Louisiana. And so same sources, same guys. You know, it's almost like, well, now that I know you pretty well, let's see what you did for the rest of the war, and that's kind of where I am now. So you just followed them as they went through? I did. I just followed the sources. And what I figured out, and this is kind of a rarity in in our disciplines, Mm -hmm. is that I found a big part of a large story that hadn't been covered. You know, th- th- this to me is so weird that a part of the Civil War hasn't been covered. There's how many thousands of books oh, they say on the Civil War? Yeah, there's more ink spilled on the topic of the American Civil War just after Christianity. So Jesus gets top <laughs> billing, and then Robert E. Lee and the you boys know. get you know second billing. So and, yeah, and how many actual Civil War battles were in New Mexico in that campaign? In the New Mexico campaign, yeah. there's two big ones: Valverde and Glorieta. And so it's a pretty easy book to write. They came here, fought this one, came here, fought that one, and then, and then they, they hiked home. Yeah, and, then they and they were very hungry and, you know, all shot up and raggedy. All right. And no one wanted to come back to New Mexico. That's right. So these guys come back from New Mexico all chewed up, and after six months of rehabilitation, they're thrown right back into the meat grinder in Louisiana. And so... Um, you, what, it, what, what's the name of the books that you wrote there? Well, that's uh, the first one is Fire in the Cane Field. Okay. Second one is Thunder Across the Swamp. Mm-hmm. Third one is Blood on the Bayou. Fourth one will be Tempest Over Texas. And I had planned on cutting it off at four, but it's going to five. Oh, really? Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know you find that hard to believe. Too many words, Don. Too many words. Yes, I've this heard will that. never stop. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, sooner or later. I'd like to not write about you know the Civil War. I suspect. Um, but anyhow, the the fifth one will be Death at the Landing, and it'll cover the Red River Campaign and the, the collapse of the Confederacy in the Trans Mississippi. So, okay. Now we have a caller, but we can't put the caller on. But we have someone who wants to know. It's Chris from, where are you from, Chris? Chris, Chris, Chris. Where do you want to say you're from? Uh, uh, Colleyville. Okay, there Chris we got it. Chris from Colleyville. And As opposed he to wants Dalmatian to Bird. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we want to know, he wants to know, why these two Fraser brothers have different accents. Because he's adopted. You're adopted. But you look like him. Well, Big Spring, a lot of people just passed through, and I just <laughs> fell off the train. <laughs> the baby train came through. And, oh, look what we found next to the tracks. I don't know how come we have different accents. I can. I have a theory. Okay. All right, so I was riding an elevator one time with a linguist from Texas A&M, and he said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Abilene. He said, no, that's not it. You don't have an Abilene accent. Yeah, apparently not. So he said, where were you born? I said, Big Spring. And he said, no, that's not it either. He says, I'm going to predict that you grew up and started really speaking somewhere between San Angelo, Texas, and Laredo, Texas. But at some time in your life, you lived somewhere, I think, Georgia. And sure enough, when I was you know, four, five, six, seven, we lived in Eagle Pass, and uh, he said, yeah, you've got a Southwest Texas border accent with a little Spanish and Georgia inflection. Wow. Yeah, it's like Pygmalion. Yeah. So I'm not sure where he picked up his accent. I just talk. You just talk. Yeah. But that's it the way it sounds. More of a Big Spring, I guess, influence on yeah, him. Uh, our family's broken down into two segments, the first family, second family. The first family is the first five, and then there was a gap of two years, and then the second family. My okay. mom was pregnant a lot. Yeah, mm-hmm. a lot. Dad was a checker player. She moved, he'd jump her. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the first family first family grew up in a very stable 
you know, same <laughs> hometown environment. And the second family, we moved around all the time. I mean, I went to three different high schools. Okay. okay? It, Georgia, uh, Arlington, San Antonio. So we just picked up a little bit here and there. And, you know, we just talked pretty. <laughs> you realize I'm never going to look at checkers the same way yeah, after yeah. what you just said. <laughs> well, I, I think I, it's because he's got the gap in the front teeth mm-hmm. and you don't. Yeah, that's so that's right. the difference. I can call the dog. That's for dang right? <laughs> okay. When we come back, please, we're going to have to take another break in 28 seconds. Am I right, Scott, the engineer? You, you're right. Okay. Um, we need to talk a little bit about the teaching of history and what you do, why you do it, how do you get the response that you want? And what is that response that you want? Okay, you're working with underprivileged mm-hmm, kids mm-hmm. in East Texas and Don. College you're working kids. here, college kids at a liberal arts school. So we'll be back in just a moment. And we're back here on the Professor's Podcast. I'm Paul Fabrizio. I'm Don Frazier. And we're talking again to the Frazier brothers about teaching history. And so let's go back, Tim. Back in history. Back in history. (laughs) You like to teach. What is your philosophy to teach? It has to be fun. If history's not fun, you're going to lose them. And it's different by age. Seventh graders, it's 10 minutes of talkie. The rest of the time, worksheets, because they absorb by seeing and, and doing, physically doing. Well, when I made up my mind that I was not going to be boring, like I was taught history, because I was taught history by Coach Shut the Hell Up. <laughs> yeah, all of our history yeah. teachers' first name was Coach. Yeah, and they would, you know, they would design history plays or, or football plays, and open the book, read the chapter, and answer the questions at the end of the chapter. And I just hated that course. I liked reading. I didn't like answering the question. So it was just, this is so incredibly boring. And I decided I'm not going to be boring. And I'm also not going to humiliate a kid over their grades. Math was not my subject. And I remember my math teacher coming up to me and going, no matter what you do, you make an A on the final, you'll never pass this class. 
So don't waste your time. That was in front of God and everybody. In front of my entire yeah. class. It scarred you forever. Uh, well, it left a mark. I yeah. won't, I won't yeah. make you fun of their grades. Now, if they're misbehaving, I will publicly oh, humiliate absolutely. them. I love doing that because it's always good to you know make an example. Public shaming <laughs> works. Yeah, yes. Yes. but uh, I just I want it to be fun. So when, when we're talking about the conquest of Mexico, that can get really boring. Mm-hmm. But if you throw in stuff like, well, Steve the Spaniard said, oh, Eugene the Aztec is shooting me. And then I'll go, he said Steve, he said Eugene. And it becomes <laughs> relative. And they remember that. For example, I was teaching about the uh, the beginning of World War One, and the shooting of Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, right? So did you dress up as? No. What I did was I put it in language they could understand. And I said that Princip didn't find anyone to shoot, so he stopped at Taco Bell, got the burrito grande. It was sitting outside the Taco Bell eating his burrito grande, and here comes Franz Ferdinand right there. Throws down his burrito, pop, pop, bust a cap in him, and they're done. Well, I had a girl taking her test, her uh, state-required test, and she goes, all I could remember was the guy eating the burrito and shooting Franz Ferdinand. She got the question right. So, By the way, did he pick up the burrito after he did the no, shooting? No, no, he went to jail hard. Okay, okay. <laughs> but the same thing happened to Tupac. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if you, History repeats itself. <laughs> there you go. If you throw it in their direction in a way that is relative, I mean, anyone can get up there and go, it up and back and you talk like Professor Plum. Or the Encyclopedia Britannica films yeah. like we watch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. With the, the wavy music and everything. The American Steelworker. <laughs> no, uh-uh, I'm not going to do that. And now we're so lucky because we have, you know, the the the... Library of Alexandria online with the internet. Yeah, everybody's got an auxiliary brain strapped to their hip. I mean, and it might... This thing here, yeah. the phone, but doesn't this affect how you teach? I mean, in the sense that uh, students don't seem to want to read as much unless it's on this thing. If you use, but that's still reading. Okay. If you use the Socratic method, Mr. Fraser, what does, you know, what is cause and effect? I don't know. What's the Google say? Well, I didn't look it up. Well, don't you think you should look it up? Get your phone out. And I can always tell if they're looking up stuff on their phone. Or shopping for shoes. Or texting. Yeah. You do not listen to music like this. Right. Okay? And in my room, phones are totally legal as long as you're doing your work. And yeah, if you send your buddy a text, big deal. Are you getting the work done? I have a whole PowerPoint that when I can tell when the kids aren't doing their work, it's 10 slides with like eight phrases each do the work and then i'll lower the shade next time i get onto them there's work you should do it and it ends up with i'll have a large work with a side order of do the work and a chocolate do the work <laughs> and what happens is the kids start reading that and they start laughing and then they go back to work what is it like to teach the 12th graders compared to the seventh graders you said the seventh graders you need yeah. those worksheets and they can do things in short bursts. Exactly. What about the 12th graders? Of 12th graders, I have for government and economics. And for government, it's a lot of reading the headlines and then translating that into how our government works and how things are working. Man, that's Fabrizio's wheelhouse there. And then for economics, the very first thing we do is we start day one playing how the stock market works. It's real numbers with fake money. Okay. And we play that till the end of the school year. So okay. experiential learning. One of my kids upped his portfolio 777%. Wow. By playing penny stocks. And he is now putting himself <laughs> through college playing at the, the University, of Houston, University of Houston by playing nothing but the stock market. Okay. Let's turn to Don. Wow. Don, I got nothing like that. Yeah. He, <laughs> car- he, he got us through high school. You yeah. take over in college. Well, I mean... What, what do you do? It's sim- similar sort of activities. I mean, the phone is your friend because you can get into the, the material. I have seen myself going from, at the beginning of my career, being the sage on the stage. You know, I was the font of all knowledge. And I would spew forth, and they would write down and regurgitate back on the test. But now... How'd that turn out for you? Yeah, well, after a while, I looked down and I saw nothing but the tops of their heads. 
and they're looking down at their laps, and I'm going, there's either some sort of embarrassing social disease that's <laughs> spreading through this class or something else that's going on here. And so, uh, it turns out they're all looking at their phones. Mm-hmm. And so I said, wait a second, something's changed here. I've gone from being the purveyor to now I'm merely the guide. You know, it was once said about George Armstrong Custer that he had the knowledge but not the wisdom to fight the Indians. And uh, What an interesting well, the, comment. Yeah. The other thing about Custer is everybody wants to know, at what point in time in the Little Bighorn did he go, oh, f-. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, excuse that. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to bleep. And so, uh, do you do that in your school? Yeah, but I say ship. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, Don, and so go back any, to Custer. Uh, uh, yeah, we can do a little more of that at the college level because they're all adults. I mean, my kids can all go to Afghanistan, so, you know. Yeah. They, it's a little more real for them. And so uh, I became the, the sort of the guide instead of the purveyor. And so these kids have charts and maps, and they know all sorts of stuff, uh, or they can, they can know all sorts of stuff. Uh, but they need somebody that's been down that way before to help guide them through the material. And that's really been the, the major shift in the way that I do, uh, so I do you, history. So you went from a sage to a guide. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, yeah. very good. Now, we're coming to the end of our first program, our first podcast. We got less than 30 seconds left, right, Scott, the engineer? Yes, 15 seconds. 15 seconds. So we want to thank Tim Frazier. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. And, again, you're related to this guy, Don Frazier. So you have a permanent standing invitation to come back. Oh, far out. Yeah. So if you want to get away from your students, here you go. And we're out. Class dismissed.